Turn with me, please, to the book of the Revelation, chapter 7, as we continue our study a second time in the book of Revelation, chapter 7. We remember again, as we rehearse each time we open this particular book, of the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is for God's people to show to His servants the things that must soon take place. This is a book for believers. This is a book to encourage us to be ready for the any moment return of Jesus Christ. We read three times in the last two chapters, Behold, I am coming soon. Behold, I am coming soon. Behold, I am coming soon. And we are told to be ready because at such a time, Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, that you think not the Son of Man comes. Christ is coming, whether you're ready or whether I'm ready or not. But the purpose of this book is so that we would be ready and we would live in eager anticipation of His coming. The person in the book that is revealed is Christ. He is revealed in His glory, revealed in His authority, revealed in His sovereignty, revealed in His wrath, revealed in His grace, revealed in His compassion. It is Christ that is revealed in this book. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And He is the one we need to see as we open the pages of the book of the Revelation. In it, we see Satan's purpose to steal and kill and destroy. We see the sinner's passions growing worse and worse. And as the tribulation comes upon this world, we will see that as the plagues increase and the death increases and the horror increases and the chaos increases, the hearts of men are not melted towards the gospel. They are hardened against it. And so we see in this revelation, the revelation of the hardness of the heart of man. We also see in this book, the patience of the saints. Twice we are told in chapter 14 and chapter 17 that this revelation of the antagonism of Satan against God's people requires patient perseverance on the part of the saints. Patient perseverance. You must be prepared to endure trouble. That's not only true of tribulation saints, but it's true of saints in the church age. Affliction, persecution, suffering, antagonism, and an ever-increasing chaos in this world is the expectation of the church age believer, even as it is of the tribulation saint. We must not think that because we are awaiting a pre-tribulational rapture and return of Christ that we will therefore be exempt from suffering, from persecution, and from chaos. We could certainly invite Brother Nunemaker back up to the platform to discuss and talk to us about the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Christ in Central Africa in the Sudan, in Rwanda, of the horrors, of the persecution. I'm sure when they read the book of the Revelation, they think they're reading the description of the very day in which they're living. And therefore, we must be prepared to endure for the sake of Christ and not compromise the truth of the gospel because it becomes less and less acceptable in the society in which we live. Let it become less and less acceptable. Let God be true and every man a liar. We must stand on the truth of the gospel because we love Christ and we love lost people. And it is the truth of the gospel that the world hates that is their only hope. So let us stand true with love for those who oppose it. And we also see, ultimately, God's wrath and victory. I have spent much time this first five months of the year memorizing Scripture, and among the chapters I've memorized are Revelation 21 and 22. And every morning on my way to work, I quote those two chapters, along with four others, to remind myself of the glorious future. In the midst of the chaos of the present, 
It is the eye that is fixed on the certainty of the coming of Christ that is the eye that sees clearly. Blessed hope. Blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 7. We are now dealing with God's saving purpose for His people Israel. God's saving purpose for His people Israel. As you know, God promised in the Old Testament that He would save a remnant. He would save His people. He would be faithful to His people Israel for all generations. And even though now we are taught in the New Testament that there is no Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female, but all are one in Christ, yet that does not discount the fact that there is a future for Israel. And God has described that future for us here in the book of the Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back, notice, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Now, you're going to see as you move into chapter 8 that the angels are going to release those four winds. And this isn't just little gentle breezes that are coming together. This is the idea of a cyclone of a tornado of judgment that is coming upon the earth. But before that judgment takes place, these angels are holding the wrath back. This is describing now the onset of the tribulation period, the last seven years of God's predictive judgment described in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 23 to 27, when he shall finish his plan before bringing in his kingdom upon earth the millennial kingdom. So Revelation 7, Revelation 6 gave us the overview of the entire tribulation period up to and including the second coming. Now we're going to take it apart and we begin now in chapter 7 with God's covenant purpose for His people Israel. Then I saw, verse 2, another angel coming up from the east having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to notice harm, harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. This is God's mark of ownership on 144,000 Jews that he will save at the outset of the tribulation period and that he will preserve And that through them will populate the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom of Christ. So this is his preservation in the keeping of his covenant promise to the people of Israel. Verse 4, then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000, and then 12,000 each from Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. We notice in here that Dan is not included and Ephraim's name is changed to Joseph. I don't have any description for you as to why that may be. As soon as the rapture takes place, look me up and we'll both know. Verse 9, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, language. You notice it's not just the Jews now. It's a great multitude now that we see of Gentiles. It says every nation, tribe, people, and language, and it's a great multitude, innumerable, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And you notice again, the picture is of their ultimate glorification in heaven. Whether it's Old Testament saints, whether it's church age saints, whether it's tribulation saints, or whether it's millennial saints, the ultimate destiny of every believer, regardless of the covenant under which we're operating, is the presence of God. Abraham will be in the presence of God. You, if you're a born-again Christian, will be in the presence of God. The 144,000 are going to be in the presence of God. These Gentiles saved during the tribulation will be in the presence of God. There's not going to be different destinies. There's one destiny. And each time the book of the Revelation prepares us for tribulation and judgment, it always gives us a preview of the end of God's own. It always does that, even with the letters to the seven churches. 
It tells about their struggles, it tells about their failures, it tells about their faithfulness, and at the end of each one it says, and this is the reward to those who overcome. Then you move into chapter 4 and 5, and we have the reward experienced of the saints in heaven. And then we come back down to earth in chapter 6, and we see the tribulation and the judgment of God upon earth. And then we come to chapter 7, we see God's covenant faithfulness to his people Israel. And then we see that through them, a great multitude of Gentiles will be saved during the tribulation period. God will still be saving souls during the tribulation. Apparently, he's going to be saving a multitude of them. And what will their end be? Even though many of them will be martyred, even though it will be a horrible, indescribably horrible seven years of judgment, yet notice the destiny. Regardless of how awful the present experience, keep destiny in view. Where do they stand? Verse 9. Before the throne and in front of the Lamb. <laughs> face to face. Right there. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they, this saved people, cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's where salvation comes from doesn't come from the suffering of the saints. It doesn't come from the faithfulness of the saints. Salvation comes from our God and from the Lamb. Now, verse 11, all the angels were standing around the throne. Now, remember all the angels we saw earlier, that innumerable 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands upon thousands that had been cl closing in in chapter 5 to sing the praises of the Lamb around the 24 elders and the four living creatures. Remember, well, here they are again. It says, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And notice, they fell down. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Now, notice what the angels say, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. You see, angels are astounded by the saving grace of God towards the likes of us. We'll see that more in a moment. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, now you saw that in verse 9, this huge multitude wearing white robes, right? In verse 9. So now in verse 13, one of the elders said, These in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. So they're obviously people who've been saved during the seven-year tribulation period. And have what? Washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Washed their robes and made them white in the blood? Doesn't that sound absolutely impossible? How many of you have gotten blood on white cloth? <laughs> you know, preachers used to wear white shirts all the time. And uh, there's a preacher right there, white shirt. Ever got blood on that shirt, Jess? Not that one particular, but one? <laughs> oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> oh, my. It, it didn't make it white. It didn't get whiter because blood hit it. But the picture here is that it is the blood of Christ, which ordinarily we would think would irreversibly stain the garment, gloriously cleanses it. It takes us back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, where the Lord said, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as wool, as snow. You see, the picture is that our sins have stained our garments, but it is the blood of Jesus Christ that removes the stain of sin. And red on red brings white, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are, look at it, before the throne of God. They are before the throne. Why? Because they've been washed. 
because they've been cleansed through Jesus' shed blood. They are, therefore, they are before the throne of God. Nobody comes before the throne without being cleansed. Nobody comes before the throne to be accepted apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. These are they that came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. He who sits on the throne will spread His tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Now, at the dinner table, it might be good for you to have one of you read this text and another read Psalm 23 next to it, because you'll see it fulfilled in every respect. Jesus is that shepherd of the sheep so that we have no lack. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Fulfilled to all of God's people. Finally, fully, ultimately, and eternally before the throne. Now take your Bible, please, and turn with me to a couple of passages so that we can see this whole thing in its Old Testament context. First, turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, we're going to go to the 12th chapter of Daniel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And the last chapter, 12. This prophetic book of Daniel lines up with the book of the Revelation. We're not doing a lot in Daniel, but uh, that certainly goes side by side with the book of the Revelation. We notice that chapter 12, as it speaks of the tribulation period, at that time, Michael, chapter 12, verse 1, the great prince, this is the Michael, the archangel, who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people... Who were the people of Daniel? The Jews. Your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book. As we move on in the book of the Revelation, we find in chapter 21 and 22 that the new Jerusalem and the ultimate fulfillment of all of the saved of the ages is for those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what this is referring to. Will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, resurrection. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Everybody is raised from the dead, saved or lost. Those who are wise, believers who have trusted Christ, will shine as the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Now, when you get to the book of the Revelation, we are told in... Chapter 21, by the angel to John, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is at hand. So here we have Daniel being told to cool it. It's not going to be for a good long while. The book of the Revelation, we are told to anticipate the fulfillment of it. Verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? Verse 7, The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever and ever, it will be for a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years. This is the conclusion of the tribulation period. When the power of the holy people, Israel, 
has been finally broken by the treachery of the Antichrist, all these things will be completed. I heard, but I didn't understand, so I asked my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? And he replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time the daily sacrifice is abolished, this will be halfway through the tribulation period, when the beast breaks his covenant with Israel. And the abomination that causes desolation is set up, that's the image of the beast, that becomes the object of worship under the tutelage of the Antichrist, the false prophet. There will be 1,290 days, three and a half years. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days, the full inauguration of the millennial kingdom. As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Now, you remember Daniel was a prisoner, as it were, an exile in Babylon. His allotted inheritance has to do with his inheritance in Israel whose land had been desecrated through the captivity. But God is telling him that he will still receive his ultimate inheritance as a child of Jacob, an Israelite, a Jew. So we see that God promises that he will still preserve his people. He will preserve them and fulfill His covenant promises to them. Now turn with me to the book of Joel. Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Joel, I want you to turn to chapter 2 and in the interest of time, verse 28. And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Of course, that we saw fulfilled in the book of Acts as Peter quotes it in chapter 2. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And then he moves us ahead. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. This is the tribulation period. Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the day of his wrath when he comes to earth to punish the wicked. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion... And in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, look at it, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. That's your 144,000. That's those 144,000 that God said He would preserve and would fulfill His covenant promises to. So as we're told over in the book of Romans, chapter 9 and chapter 11, that God is not done with Israel, that when the days of the Gentiles are fulfilled, God will fulfill His promises to Israel. Turn there, if you will, to Romans one more time. Romans chapter 11. Romans and chapter 11. Verse 1, I ask then, did God reject His people, the Israelites? By no means. Verse 5, so too at the present time there is a remnant of Jews chosen by grace who are being saved and brought into the church. But there will be more who will be saved later on. Chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. Again, I ask, did they, the Jews, stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Is God through with the Jews? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgressions, salvations come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression, that is their rejection of the gospel as a people, means riches for the world, that the gospel goes to the Gentiles, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater will their fullness bring? You see, there's a future for the Jews. There is a fullness that is yet coming. God's not through with the Jews. As a people, they are rejecting the gospel. As a nation, they are rejecting the gospel. But there is a future for them, which future will be inaugurated at the beginning of the tribulation period. Verse 25, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. 
And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. You see, there's a future for the Jews. And that future of all Israel is represented in the 144,000 back in Revelation chapter 7. This does not mean that every Jewish person is saved. It does not mean that at all. It means the nation will be saved as a people through the 144,000 that God will save at the start of the tribulation period. It does not simply mean because you are a child of Abraham, that is a Jew, you will be saved. No, not at all. And that's very clear. If you read all of Romans 9, 10, and 11, it is only those who call upon Christ that will be saved. Those who reject Him will not be. But the nation will be saved as God seals and saves those 144,000 and will rebuild the nation through them during the millennial kingdom. So we see wrath restrained, and then we see Jews sealed, and we see the multitudes praise. Now I want you to notice here that with this mark of God upon His people, we begin the inauguration of the great contrast in the book of the Revelation. We begin the inauguration of the great contrast between those who belong to Christ and those who belong to Satan. The first thing we see here is this mark, this seal. Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, Don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed. This is the mark of God. Now this is a mark known by God. This is a mark of ownership. God saying, you are mine. There is a like symbol for the believer today found in the person of the Holy Spirit. We are told in Ephesians chapter 1 that we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. He is the seal. And we're told in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you've been sealed to the day of redemption. And so the seal is the mark of God upon his own. Now as you move farther along in the book of the Revelation, you find the first and the second beast raised up in chapters 12 and 13. And if you look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, you will see the seal or the mark of the beast, Satan's mark upon those who belong to Satan's followers. And so we see two marks, the mark of God and the mark of the beast. We see two lambs. Remember back in chapter 5 where John was weeping because no one was found worthy to open the scroll? And the angel said, don't weep. And one of the elders said, don't weep. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. And it says in Revelation 5, I believe it's verse 5. He says, and I looked and saw a lamb. Remember that? He saw a lamb as it had been slain. But then when we move ahead in the book of the Revelation, we come to uh, chapter 13. We also see him called the lamb here in chapter 7 uh, and in verse 14, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. But now turn with me, if you will, to Revelation 13, verse 15. Revelation 13, verse 15. This is the beast out of the earth, the false prophet, the Jewish false Christ, who will be raised up during the tribulation period. He was given power to give breath to the image of the beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. I want you to go back to verse 11 of chapter 13. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a, like a what? Like a lamb, but he spoke like the dragon. Now we know from back in chapter 12 that the dragon is a symbol of Satan. Now this one looked like a lamb, two horns, but he spoke like a dragon. He was the mouth of Satan. 
the Antichrist, the false Christ. So we have two seals, the seal of Christ, the Lamb, and the seal of Satan, the beast, the mark of the beast. We have two lambs, the true Lamb and the Antichrist, the Christ and the Antichrist. We have two cities, Revelation 21-2, we have the New Jerusalem, but then we have Babylon, the mystery, the imposter. We have two cities. We have two women, the bride and the prostitute. Revelation 21.9, believers are called the bride. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he showed me the New Jerusalem. But then we find in the book of the Revelation, chapter 17, verse 1, this great worldwide religious system called the great harlot or the great prostitute which pictures herself as a bride, but is not worshiping the Lamb. She is worshiping Satan. You see the two symbols all the way through the book of the Revelation? You have two marks. You have two lambs, if you will, the true and the false. You have two cities. You have two women. You have two suppers. Revelation 19.9, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And I understand that to mean the millennial kingdom. But you move a little farther along in Revelation 19 and you have God's call to the vultures to come to the great supper of God. And that's not the marriage supper of the lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb is for those who have the mark of the Lamb, for those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, for those who are citizens of the New Jerusalem, for those whose names are in the Lamb's book of life. They come to the marriage supper of the Lamb to rejoice as the bride. But the great supper of God is for the great prostitute, for those who have the mark of the beast, for those who follow the Antichrist. You see the difference? The marriage supper of the Lamb, the great supper of God. You have two armies, heaven's army, Revelation 19, 14, and I saw him upon a white horse coming, and the army with him was called and chosen and faithful. And then you have the army of the beast on earth who are fighting against the Lamb. You have two deaths, Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, says that you may die physically, as a follower of Jesus Christ, but upon you the second death has no power. But we move fast forward to Revelation chapter 21 and we read, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts and all liars, their place shall be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. You see, there's two deaths. There's two cities, there's two lambs, there's two marks. Then we see two resurrections. Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6 says, Blessed is he who takes part in the first resurrection. The resurrection of those who have God's mark who are part of the bride, who are citizens of the New Jerusalem. But then there's a second resurrection. And that's called the great white throne. It is the resurrection of Satan's people. The resurrection of the lost, whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life. There are two universes. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a New earth for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away and there was no longer any sea. You see, there's two universes. There's the old one in which we're living and then there's the new one that's coming. But you see, those who live for this world, those who live for this life, those who live for the God, little g, God of this age, those who follow the beast, those who have the mark of the beast, those who are citizens of Babylon, the city of the beast, those who listen to the voice of the Antichrist, the deceiver, They have no new heavens and new earth. Because you see, at the end, there's two destinies. The river of the water of life and the lake of fire. 
You see the contrast in the book of the Revelation? Don't miss it. With all the details of the plagues and the trumpets and the vile judgments, don't miss the big picture that's telling us Christ is coming. There's no safe middle ground. You are saved or lost. You are citizens of the New Jerusalem or you are citizens of Babylon, which shall be destroyed. Your inheritance is the New Jerusalem or the lake of fire. You'll have the river of the water of life or the lake of burning sulfur. There's no safe middle ground. There's no almost. You're either His or you're not. There's only two destinies. There's only one Savior. There's no middle ground. You're saved or you're lost. You belong to Christ or to Satan. I know who you are. Whose are you? Who do you belong to? Who's your master? You say, I'm my own master. You just confessed it. You're a Satan slave because he's the great deceiver. He delights in making you think you're in charge until it becomes clear when it's too late you never were. Don't listen to the deceiver. Claim Christ as Savior, Lamb, Lord, and life. Whose are you? Whose are you? By His grace, can you say, I am His and He is mine. There's no room for doubts in this, my friends. There's no room for doubts in this. Settle it today. If you're unsure, settle it today. Come to Christ. He will receive you. If you come with a repentant heart, confessing your sin and claiming His blood as your cleansing, And then it will be said of you, blessed are they who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. What will the inheritance of them be? They are before the throne of God, their presence. They serve Him day and night. That's their purpose. How do I know if I belong to Him? Because I delight in His presence. I delight in the presence of God. Because I'm washed by the blood of His Son. What is my purpose? To serve Him. Are you serving Him today? What do you think? You're going to want to serve Him in eternity if you don't want to serve Him today? If you have no desire to serve Him today, you're not saved. I say that cautiously, but I say that clearly. If you have no desire to serve God. You're not saved. Because the very fruit of salvation is a new heart and a new passion and a new desire. A new birth. And a new resident, the Holy Spirit. Why do you think you would enjoy serving God in eternity if you don't passionately desire to serve Him today? Heaven will not change your nature. Your nature is already changed if you're born again. Changes our condition. But the new birth is new now. You see, their purpose to serve Him day and night, their protection, He'll spread His tent over them. These that are mentioned will suffer greatly and lose everything. Tormented, afflicted, suffering, but... On that day, God will spread His tent over them, and there will be shade 
and there will be comfort, and there will be peace, and there will be the presence of God, and there will be the delight of serving Him. And it says, the sun won't beat on them, there won't be any scorching heat, and the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and He'll lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Oh, the blessedness of belonging to the Lamb. Oh, the glory of the future that awaits us. Now, I know you've heard people say, well, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. I would say to you that if you're not heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. For if you live not with one eye upon that throne, you wander in darkness. It is this, you see, that is given to us at the beginning of the tribulation period, this narrative of the end of those who will suffer greatly, but who will rejoice greatly when the end comes. Jeremiah Burroughs, the old Puritan preacher, was wont to say, your last day on earth is a good friend. Keep him close. He gives wise counsel. Think about that one. Your last day on earth is a good friend. Keep him close. He gives wise counsel. See, that's what it's doing right here. Helping us to see the end before we get there. So we live today well. Let's pray. Lord, how we rejoice at the holy privilege of belonging to you. And Lord, we want to serve you now, not just then. We want to love you now, serve you now, walk with you now, testify to you now, be faithful to you now in the midst of a chaotic world where the gospel is hated. Oh Lord, may our lives shine like light in the darkness with the love of Christ and the truth of the gospel. Fill us with it, we pray, that we may be your witnesses today. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together, sing this refrain once more as we close. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Purchase of God, Lord of His Spirit.